They did it because they knew America's future was more important than either party. Now, I often hear my colleagues on the other side of the aisle only talking about the spending problems of the country. Madam President, could I ask uh, how much time I have used? The senator has used 14 minutes. Thank you. Uh, I often hear my colleagues talking about the spending problem, but what they forget about is we had a surplus that we created in the 1990s by making the tough decisions. We invested in the future of our country and we created 23 million new jobs. And in the 1990s, when we balanced the budget, let's not forget that. Some of us were here and made those tough votes and we balanced the budget. And we created 23 million jobs. Every income level in America went up, every single income level. And we did it at a time uh, Madam President, when the total relationship of spending to GDP was exactly where many of us believe we ought to take it today, somewhere around 21 or 22 percent. The fact is that it was President Bush's tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans that we couldn't afford and a war that he refused to pay for in Iraq and then Afghanistan, or Afghanistan and then Iraq, both wars totaling well over trillion, two trillion dollars. That will ultimately, both of those, the tax cuts and the wars account for about seven trillion dollars in deficits in 2009 and going forward. Now, Madam President, the facts are clear. The tax cuts that President Bush put in place contributed to the deficit and the revenues have got to be addressed if we're going to go forward and deal with this. Uh, federal revenues today, the money the government takes in, is at its lowest level since 1950. We've had a 60 percent reduction in revenue and a 60 percent increase in expenditures. And right now, we're at the lowest level of revenue taken in that we've been at since the 1950s. And they're only about 14% of the total GDP. The fact is that the last five times we balanced the budget, those revenues were about 19 or 20% of GDP. So here we are at 14%. We've balanced the budget five times previously, and the revenues were at about 19.5 to 20 percent of GDP. Doesn't that tell us something? Now, there's another problem that we have. It's right here on my desk. We have a tax code. The tax code has eight volumes, over 72,500 pages. This is the Internal Revenue Code, 4,052 pages. I would ask any American, do you have your own page in this tax code? How many Americans have their own page in this tax code? Well, I got news for you, 72,500 entities, a lot of businesses have found a way to get their little break in the tax code. Last month, the Senate, by a vote of 73 to 27, sent a clear signal that we ought to start looking at some of these subsidies. This entire tax code is riddled with special deals which lobbyists have worked against the interest of average Americans in most cases. Let me give you a couple of examples. Section 168 in this code has a special rule for racehorse depreciation. How many folks in America uh, are worried about their racehorse today and the depreciation on it? But they've got a provision in here that allows the depreciation of racehorses to go from seven years to three years. And those difference of seven years to three years costs the average American money. The average American is supporting that because it's a foregone revenue. We're giving away the revenue and we're giving it back to somebody who doesn't fundamentally need it. The tax code includes a definition of three-year property. 
Get this, any horse other than a racehorse which is more than 12 years old at the time it is placed in service. I mean, who writes this stuff? Where does this come from? Not only is that a waste of taxpayer money, it makes the tax code more complex. It requires more regulations and more confusion. A lot of tax lawyers love this, these eight volumes, but the average American ought to be furious at these volumes because these volumes are stealing America's opportunities in a host of other choices that we could be making, like education, investment in energy, energy independence, taking care of our veterans, doing a whole bunch of things that are substitutes for some of the choices that are made. Let me give you a couple of other examples. On April, uh, this is, uh, here's a provision. Uh, the follow, it's, it's included in one of the regulations. On April 2000, E acquires a horse to be used in E's thoroughbred racing on October 1st, 2003. F buys the horse from E and will use the horse in F's horse breeding business. The use of the horse by E in its racing business prevents the original use of the horse from commencing with F. Thus, F's purchase price of the horse does not qualify for the additional first year depreciation deduction. I mean, how ridiculous can it get? that we're getting into specific cases like that which uh, run contrary to the sort of common sense of average Americans. Uh, you know, you've got to be able to afford a lobbyist to be on one of these pages. Last year, more than $3.5 billion was spent on lobbying in Washington, D.C. There are more than 13,000 lobbyists trying to influence the legislation in Washington. And believe me, it works. Look at the last 50 years. And, you know, back in 2004, we passed a bill which the New York Times described as including, good, this is a quote, goodies for almost every kind of corporation. And that, quote, perhaps the most amazing provision might be called the Foreign Gambler Relief Act. Under prior law, if you're lucky and you win big at the horse or dog track, your winnings are subject to a withholding tax. Kind of logical. But now, foreigners don't have to pay tax on their winnings. They found a lobbyist, and they got it in the tax code, and we passed it somehow. Section 872 of the tax code excludes gross income from, excludes from gross income, quote, income derived from wagering transactions in certain paramutual pools. It especially says, gross income derived by a non-resident alien individual from a legal wagering transaction initiated outside the United States in a paramutual pool with respect to a live horse race or dog race in the United States. Now, until I read this, I wasn't absolutely certain what a paramutual pool was, but I do know that a provision like that does not get in here without lobbying, and it comes at the expense of a lot of other choices. Because the problem is, all these breaks in here, whether it's subsidies for oil, subsidies for gas exploration, which made sense 60 and 70 years ago. But here we are with record profits coming into these companies. $35 billion of profit just for the last quarter, three months. And yet, they get a break. And that break comes at the expense of average folks having the school that they deserve, having the road that they want to r ride on properly, having decent public transportation. Those are the choices, and those are some of the things that we're fighting for here. Now, one of the other things that we're fighting for, there are a bunch of these. I don't have time to go into all of them now. But let me just say uh, that... We need to think hard about what's fair in America. The only tax that President Obama or we Democrats have talked about is the wealthiest people, millionaires, people earning more than a million dollars a year. That's about 7,000 plus lucky families and individuals in the United States. All we're doing is talking about asking them, who benefit enormously from the strength of our economy, 
and the strength of our military and all the things we need to do. We're just asking them, is it really too much to go from 36.9% up to 39.6%, which is where they were in the year 2000, before President Bush gave them a tax cut we couldn't pay for? It's not as if they've done badly these last 10 years. The fact is that more wealth has been accumulated in the hands of the smallest part of America, the top 1%, than at any time in America's history. The wealthy today are far wealthier than when we had no income tax and when we had the great names of the 1920s and 30s and the Industrial Revolution, Pierpont's, Morgan's, Carnegie's, Mellon's, Rockefeller, and so forth. Much wealthier today. And yet, they're paying far less of their share than at any time in modern history. Here we are with a deficit problem. They're talking about cutting Medicaid. They're talking about cutting Medicare. They're talking about cutting education loans, making it more expensive for kids to go to college. The one thing we desperately need in order to compete with the rest of the world, people who've got a college education. So I don't hear anybody in America saying, hey, make it harder for my kid to go to college. But that's what they're doing in their budget. It's exactly what they do. But they stand up adamantly and say, no way we will allow people earning more than a million dollars a year to pay anything additional into the system. It's just wrong. It's morally wrong. It's repugnant that in this country we are condoning the institutionalization of a larger and larger gap between the haves and the have-nots, between the people who have already gotten their brass ring and the people who are trying to reach it. That is not the American story. And I believe that we need to fight to have a balanced approach. President Obama and the Democratic proposals that I've seen and we've talked about, and I hope people will hear more about in the next days, give a tax cut to about 98% of America. 98% of America gets a tax cut. The only people we're talking about trying to ask, kick in to give some more revenue, are people earning the most. If you're earning $500,000 a year today, you would not pay any additional tax on your first $250,000. So on the next $250,000, all you'd pay is $12,000 of additional tax. Let me ask you. Uh, no, I will say, Madam President, I know this. There isn't one business person, there isn't one millionaire for whom $12,000 will change one consumer purchase, one decision of investment, not one. And all this talk about how it will slow down the economy or hurt America is just bunk. It's not true. So we need to have a real discussion. We need to have a real effort here that I think matches the greatness of this institution with this moment. This can be the world's greatest deliberative body. But we need to put all of these issues on the table. We need to debate them openly. We need to have the courage of our convictions, vote up or down, and do what is needed to put our country on track. Because right now, we are losing countless investment opportunities, countless job opportunities, and if we don't make the right choices here, we are going to have a very difficult time living up to the promise uh, that all of us hope to live up to in our time here uh, in this office. I thank the chair. I ask uh, the unanimous consent that full text be placed in the record as if read in full. Without objection. Madam President. The senator from Arizona. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent for 15 minutes uh, to address this body as of in morning business. Without objection. Madam President, uh, it is well known to all uh, Americans that have observed and certainly the media and certainly members of this body in the Congress that the uh, debt limit talks are bogged, bogged down, that there has been little if any progress, certainly not any perceptible to the American people, and we are in a gridlock, a gridlock that is not favored by 
many Americans. In fact, I continue to hear from my constituents the, co the call, why can't, why can't you all sit down and work this out? Why can't we not be faced with a shutdown of the government and the loss of the important services that the federal government gives to uh, uh, the American people, most of which they have earned and all of which they deserve. So here we are with the President of the United States demanding that there be tax increases. And the Republicans, as certainly many of them, are insisting on a balanced budget amendment which cannot pass the Congress of the United States. So on the one hand, President Obama and the, my friends on the other side of the aisle insist on tax increases and argue uh, somewhat inflammatory and populist issues such as corporate jets, uh, carried interest for private equity, oil and gas, um, and those are hard. Those are hard to defend. At the same time, it is very clear that the American people spoke and administered what the President of the United States called a shellacking last November that they want us to stop mortgaging our children's and our grandchildren's future and get the spending under control. And I have yet to meet a constituent who wants their taxes increased. So we are in a gridlock. There will be a meeting uh, uh, tomorrow on the debt crisis, again, this time between the President and leaders of Congress, and we will all succeed. But it is my view, the way to break this gridlock is to agree, is to agree to certain tax increases and closing loopholes, but only in return for an overall reduction of the corporate tax rate. That way, Republicans can say that we have not raised taxes overall, and the administration and the Democrats can say that they eliminated loopholes and indeed made the taxation of Americans more fair. So it's time we got serious. The debt, as we all know, is $50,000 for every man, woman, and child living in America today. And that's why we have seen a rise of the Tea Party and of fiscal conservatism. And I hope that tomorrow's meeting, by the way, I hope that these negotiations could be made uh, visible to the American public by C-SPAN so that they can see what's being discussed uh, here. As I said, the debt stands at $14.5 trillion. We can't continue to sit idly by while saddling future generations of Americans with the burden. So if we're serious about our commitment to reduce our debt, eliminate the deficit, then Congress needs to start making some serious decisions, and we need to start now. I'd like to remind my colleagues, particularly in light of the impassioned speech I just listened to from my friend from Massachusetts, here's what President Obama's thoughts on the debt limit were in 2006 when he was a member of this body. And I quote him from a speech he made on the floor of the Senate, and I quote, the fact we are here today to debate raising America's debt limit is a sign of leadership failure. It's a sign that the U.S. government can't pay its own bills. It's a sign that we now depend on ongoing financial assistance from foreign countries to finance our government's reckless fiscal policies. Increasing America's debt weakens us domestically and internationally. Leadership means that the buck stops here. Instead, Washington is shifting the burden of bad choices today onto the backs of our children and grandchildren. America has a debt problem and a failure of leadership. Americans deserve better. Sen then Senator Barack Obama on the floor of this Senate. I guess it shows that on some issues with then Senate Senator Barack Obama, it's not where you stand, it's where you sit. So, I couldn't agree more with what then-Senator Obama said in 2006. Americans do deserve better. And we're in this mess today because of a serious lack of leadership 
And it's not the fault of just one of the political parties, it's the fault of both parties. Year after year of uncontrolled spending by both Republicans and Democrats has brought us to the brink of bankruptcy and the point which we'll begin to default on our obligations now just weeks away, and it's shameful. It should be inconceivable that the greatest nation in history of the world would face such a crippling debt while its leaders engage in constant partisan bickering instead of solving the problems. I'd like to bring the attention of my colleagues, the lead editorial in today's Wall Street Journal, which I believe to hold the answer, as I said, to this stalemate. And I quote from the editorial, Madam President, I ask unanimous consent that today's editorial in the Wall Street Journal entitled, A Debt Limit Breakout, be included in the record. Without objection. And I quote from it, quote, the debt limit talks in Washington are bogged down in the hedge groves with some Republicans insisting on a balanced budget amendment that can't pass Congress and President Obama insisting on tax increases that Republicans oppose. What this debate needs is a breakout strategy to wit. Republicans should answer Mr. Obama's tax call by accepting his business tax increases in return for a lower corporate tax rate. The Wall Street Journal goes on to say, we've long favored such a reform, and last year so did the Simpson-Bowles Deficit Commission and the White House Economic Advisory Council, headed by Paul Volcker. But the cause has now acquired no less a convert than Bill Clinton. Speaking Saturday at something called the Aspen Ideas Festival, the former president admitted that he had once raised tax rates on corporations. Quote, it made sense when I did it. It doesn't make sense anymore. We've got an uncompetitive rate. He said, we tax at 35% of income, although we only take about 23%. So we should cut the rate to 25% or whatever is competitive and eliminate a lot of the deductions so that we still get a fair amount and there's not so much variance in what the corporations pay, unquote. The editorial goes on to say, anyone not in thrall of class war symbolism understands that the U.S. corporate tax code provides the worst of both worlds. It makes U.S. companies less competitive, even as it raises much less revenue than advertised. Mr. Obama and Secretary of State Tim Geithner have acknowledged this in the past. The President has recently as this year's State of the Union address. As for the debt limit politics, this is also a winner. Democrats and Republicans say they've agreed privately on sizable spending cuts over a 10-year budget window. No doubt some of those cuts are less real than others, and future Congresses could rewrite any enforcement provisions passed this year. But Republicans still have an incentive to set sp spending on a downward path, and Mr. Obama has an incentive to show he is no longer a hostage of Nancy Pelosi as he runs for re-election. The political sticking point is Mr. Obama's desire for some Republican buy-in on raising revenues. His political left is still sore that he agreed to extend the Bush tax rates through 2012. Thus, he's pounding Republicans to agree to eliminate certain business tax deductions that political advisors David Axelrod and David Fluff have told him will be hard for Republicans to defend. Corporate jets carried interest for ec private equity, oil and gas, even LIFO accounting, which few understand, but can be made to sound nefarious. Whatever their individual merits, each of these would be a tax increase on business and Republicans campaigned last year on not raising taxes. But the politics is different if they can offset these revenue raisers with lower tax rates. That would let Republicans honestly claim they didn't support a net tax increase even as Mr. Obama could say that he raised revenue. Our own guess is that such a reform would raise far more money than the official scores would predict, since it would lead to a more efficient allocation of capital and less tax evasion. This would also promote economic growth, breaking out of the austerity mentality driven by debt reduction. If Mr. Obama really is worried that lower federal spending will hurt the economy, then this tax reform is also his best growth policy. The journal argues that we can offset the cost to businesses of closing loopholes and eliminating, eliminating subsidies with a cut in the corporate tax rate. I completely agree. 
We should be open-minded when considering what should be eliminated. For instance, the distorting effect of subsidies is clearly evident in the energy sector. We should eliminate these subsidies, lower the corporate tax rate, and allow the marketplace to pick winners and losers, not the government. Ethanol tax is a perfect example. A recent this year, the ethanol tax credit cost taxpayers almost $6 billion. In addition to the $41.2 billion we've already spent in subsidies on ethanol since 1980. A recent CRS, Congressional Research Service report, indicates that tax credits and subsidies for solar, wind, and geothermal power will cost $8.6 billion from 2008 to 2012. As for the oil and gas industry, the eight tax breaks recommended for elimination by President Obama would eliminate $43.6 billion in spending over 10 years. The largest amongst these tax breaks is the Section 199 manufacturing tax credit that will cost approximately $18 billion so, dollars over 10 years. We should eliminate the Section 199 tax subsidies for all industries to avoid arbitrarily picking winners and losers. Why should we value manufacturing over other service providers. Additionally, we should eliminate all agricultural subsidies, including sugar programs, in corporate welfare, in tax breaks for corporations, for things like corporate jets. We need to put aside the rhetoric of corporate jets, which is just a poll-tested political phrase concocted behind one-way mirrors. Everyone knows that eliminating all tax breaks on corporate jets won't amount to any real progress. But if we seriously looked at, corporate, at curbing corporate subsidies, all Americans would benefit. I think the need, I feel the need to provide my colleagues with some straight talk. As the journal notes, some of my Republican colleagues are, quote, insisting on a balanced budget amendment that pa can't pass Congress. Let me be clear. I'm an avid supporter of a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. Since 1983, I have introduced or co-sponsored more than a dozen bills or amendments calling for a balanced budget amendment, and I've had the privilege of voting in favor of a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution no less than 13 times in my congressional career. I applaud my colleagues for their tireless dedication to this cause, but our reality today dictates that we don't have the votes in this body to enact such a measure. Perhaps that will change after next year. I hope so. But for our purposes today, in order to avoid what would be disastrous consequences for our markets, our economy as a whole, and our standing in the world, I encourage my colleagues to lay aside, at least temporarily, their insistence that amending the Constitution be a condition of their support for a solution to this terrible problem. The Wall Street Journal editorial in, ends with this. Think about it. On the current path, both sides are headed at best for a de minimis deal that makes everyone look bad. At worst, for a major political crack up. Perhaps Mr. Obama wants a crack up to portray Republicans as extreme, as my colleague from Massachusetts just did. But Republicans at least call his bluff and answer his demands for fewer business tax deductions by saying yes, in return for lower taxes. I couldn't agree with the Wall Street Journal more. This debate desperately needs a breakout strategy. I'm pleased to see that President Clinton has joined the Wall Street Journal in embracing a common sense solution to this problem. I hope that President Obama will follow former President Clinton's lead and the example set by the great Ronald Reagan and put aside politics, work with the Congress on this matter, and accept a compromise that will allow us to responsibly deal with our debt while creating jobs and spurring economic growth. I'd like to point out again, the average effective corporate rate varies by industry, but it's far less than the 35% rate. And the injustice is that some pay much less than others if they can afford lobbyists to write loopholes or they invest in politically correct purposes. Anyone not enthrall of class war symbolism 
understands that the U.S. corporate tax code provides the worst of both worlds. It makes U.S. companies less competitive, even as it raises much less revenue than advertised. So the fact is, the corporate tax code needs to be reformed anyway. And we need to cut it to 25%. It is either the first or the second highest tax rate in the world. Yet somehow, major corporations like Whirlpool and GE end up paying no taxes. But yet small business people who can't afford a lobbyist here in Washington end up paying the 35% rates if they're, rates if they're cor incorporated. So it's time we sat down. It's time we, I, Madam President, I ask for an additional two minutes. Without objection. It's time, it's time. It's time we tell the American people who are frustrated by our lack of leadership, by our failure to come together, it is time to end the rhetoric, fulfill the commitment that we made to the American people last November who resoundingly sent the message that they want the spending cut and the mortgaging of our children's future stopped. This is a reasonable proposal that I believe with spending cuts can be a breakthrough. We can proudly return to our constituents and say that we are taking care of them, not the special interest and not hidebound ideology. Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. The Senator from Colorado. Madam President, I'd ask unanimous consent that the time for debate under the previous order be extended to 7 p.m. with all of the provisions of the previous order remaining in effect. Without objection. Madam President, I'd ask uh, unanimous consent that uh, I'd be able to speak for 15 minutes as if in morning business and then Senator Coons be allowed to speak as if in morning business for 10 minutes. Without objection. Um, Madam President, uh, I rise today, uh, let me start with Madam President, I believe we may be in a situation where we're, we're exchanging um, speeches one side and the other. So can I withdraw my unanimous consent request for Senator Coons? Consent is vitiated. All right, Madam President, thank you. Um, I came to the floor to uh, deliver a, a speech uh, on the debt ceiling and all the activity surrounding the need to increase our debt ceiling. But I, I took time to listen to Senator McCain while I was here, and I have to say that uh, I agree with Senator McCain. We need a breakout strategy. Uh, we need uh, cooler heads to prevail here today, and I think uh, many, if not all of us, could agree that our tax system is overly complex. It ought to be simplified. We ought to lower rates. We ought to end the, the loopholes and the subsidies and the deductions and let the free market uh, reign. I look forward to working with the Senator from Arizona as, as we uh, hopefully, uh, and, and hope sometimes isn't a strategy, but we get an agreement, a broad agreement. We go big. We deal with our debt. We strengthen our entitlement programs, we reduce spending, and we also find some way to generate some more revenue. So I thank the Senator from Arizona for his comments. Uh, Madam President, uh, I rise, as I just implied, because I think the fiscal challenges that confront us uh, demand a bipartisan solution. Now, both parties approach the issues before us from very different points of view, but time is truly running out on our nation, uh, structural deficits, and our long-term debt, and the need for us to address those. And I want leaders in both parties to show genuine commitment to action. And how about if we set aside our talking points so that we can get some work done? If any other members believe that the solution to our deficits and debt demand a comprehensive and bipartisan solution, like the Fiscal Commission or the Gang of Six, I'd invite them to come down to the floor and let our colleagues know. We're clearly racing towards a crisis, yet it just seems like we can't let go of the partisanship and the political posturing that creates gridlock here in the capital city of Washington. It sure strikes me as childish. I think it strikes many Americans and Coloradans as that way as well. We're more broadly having this debate because the time is upon us to decide the economic future of our country. Yes, we've got to raise the national debt, but this is about our economic future. And this is the country that will be inherited by our children and their grandchildren. And quite simply, Madam President, we're not going to win the global economic race of this 21st century unless we start taking action now to improve our economy, 
grow American jobs, and get our debt under control. With these challenges, as large as they are facing us, this is the time to set aside our political differences and challenge ourselves to put our country first. A few basic facts, Madam President, I think focus the attention. Our national debt is $14 trillion and it's growing. Today, each citizen's share of that debt is over $46,000 per individual. And if we remain on this path, which is irresponsible, there's no question about that, the Government Accountability Office projects that by 2050, our nation could owe more interest on our debt than the federal government raises in taxes in a given year. And our skyrocketing debt not only is spooking the international financial markets, but it's a serious threat to our national security. Listen to Secretary of Defense Gates or Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Admiral Mullen. They will make that point in a compelling fashion. Now look, we got here in ways that aren't simple, but unquestionably, two unpaid for wars, two rounds of massive tax cuts, an unpaid for prescription drug benefit, and drastic rescue measures needed to address the most serious economic downturn since the Great Depression have all contributed to our current situation. The solutions are even more difficult. And while we may disagree on the path forward, I think we all know in our hearts that we can't get to a solution unless we all agree to come to the negotiating willing to compromise to ensure that our country, the United States, the largest economy in the world, can honor our bills and begin to pay down our debts. And that's the challenge, that's the problem, that's the opportunity, as I see it, that brings us to the Senate floor today. Now, Madam President, we began the year with serious and I believe earnest conversations about this in not one, but two groups of lawmakers in the House and the Senate. Yet despite all the talk and a lot of hard work, rather than nearing an agreement, we seem to be coming to an impasse. In the last few weeks, the state of negotiations seem to have fallen apart, with key players choosing to walk away rather than compromise. We hit the same roadblock that always inhibits action when things get tough. Politics get in the way. And in fact, it seems like, Madam President, everybody in the world except the Congress seems to know that time is running out. Just think back to April. Standard & Poor's cut the U.S. ratings outlook to negative due to uncertainty over the budget deficits and the debt ceiling. This month, Moody's piled on, warning that it too may downgrade the U.S. ratings outlook to negative as early as July. It is July sixth because of concern over gridlock here in Washington. And I have to say the American people are running out of patience as well. Back home in Colorado, people are wondering what in the world we're doing here in Washington. I wasn't up for re-election in 2010, but I was listening to what the voters were saying. And they clearly said to us they want us focused on jobs, the economy, and the debt. And they, want us, and they wanted us to work together. Consider the direction I got recently from Kurt, who's a constituent in Arvada, Colorado. He wrote, I'm counting on you to put the interests of everyday Americans above party politics and join your legislative colleagues on both sides of the aisle in finding sensible solutions to our long-term national debt problem. Many more Coloradans have sent me similar messages. I got one from a Boy Scout, David in Evergreen, whose words are stronger than mine. He said, uh, I think the United States government should stop spending unnecessary money. We should first focus on what is necessary. It is amazing how much money our country owes. It is constantly going up. I just looked up information about the United States debt clock, and I think this debt is way too high. People in the federal government in Washington, D.C. are spending money as if they had all the money in the world. David, if you're listening, I agree. Madam President, no question Americans want quality roads, a safety net for the sick and elderly, and strong investments in education and research that will spur innovation and good-paying jobs. But we need to commit to ensuring we have the financial stability to pay for them. For too long, 
The American people have been collectively told by us here in Washington that they can have more of everything we, they want without us fully paying for it. But to preserve a promising future for our children, for Kurt's children, for David, we're going to need to face up to some hard truths. Fifty years ago, my father, former Arizona Congressman Moore Udall, supported what should only seem natural, tying spending directly to revenues. Let me give you a couple of examples. If we want to give oil companies a billion dollars in tax subsidies, then let's raise taxes by a billion dollars to pay for them. The same thing, though, goes for overseas conflicts, agricultural subsidies, infrastructure, and yes, even entitlements. Coloradans from across my home state have told me they want to see their leaders try using some common sense, the kind of common sense Americans use when they're faced with the hard job of balancing their own budgets when money is tight. As a senator, I've successfully led the fight to end wasteful earmarked spending, proposed measures to cut redundant government programs, demanded line item veto authority for the president, and yes, pushed, and I see my colleagues from the other side of the aisle here, for a sensible, balanced budget amendment to our U.S. Constitution. But these measures only serve as tools to get Washington to clean up its act, and that isn't enough. We need to suck up our courage and actually make the tough budgeting decisions. And if we're going to get anywhere, we have to realize that we all have skin in the game. And we've got to check ultimatums at the door, especially on issues like Social Security and taxes. Madam President, the challenge facing us is so great, we can't afford to let partisanship or electioneering get in the way. And both parties are guilty. For example, we can't seriously address debt reduction without looking at Social Security. If we do nothing, by 2036, Social Security benefits will have to be cut by 20 percent. Now, Congress will undoubtedly be under enormous pressure to fill in that hole in lieu of telling seniors that their benefit checks would be reduced. And to say that Social Security, when you look at it that way, must be divorced from deficit reduction, as many Democrats do, is to ignore the problem. Now, in a similar vein, it's unrealistic to maintain, as my Republican colleagues do, that raising revenues can't be a part of the deficit and debt reduction equation. We should all be honest enough to admit a simple fact. No amount of spending cuts alone will reduce our deficits without unreasonably harming Social Security and Medicare. For some to say that revenues should not be part of the deficit reduction picture is either a sign that they're not serious about getting our debt situation under control or they're being disingenuous about the dangerous implications spending cuts alone would have on our hardworking constituents who rely on these important programs. Now, Madam President, what's so agonizing about the last six months is that we have a bipartisan solution in front of us one that I know, and I just believe, but I know would responsibly reduce our debt while also allowing the economy to grow and protect our middle class. In December 2009, I know the presiding officer and I, among with a number of other senators, pushed for the creation of the President's National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, which was then chaired by Erskine Bowles, a North Carolinian, and Alan Simpson, a Wyoming resident. And they did an exhaustive study of what it would take to get our debt under control. And last year, they delivered a report on how to reduce the debt by over $4 trillion in the next decade and bend the curve back to a much more sustainable federal budget situation. They comprehensively addressed all of the issues that must be on the table, namely spending cuts, reasonable entitlement reform, and some new revenues. The plans already received bipartisan support, including senators from each party who were members of the Commission. Rather than arguing, we could be acting on these recommendations. And look, if we don't want to follow those exact recommendations, let's all at least agree that everything must be on the table in these ongoing debt discussions. Madam President, many of us here simply want to roll up our sleeves and get to work. I see some of my 
colleagues on the other side of the aisle. I know that they share that sentiment. Even if our leaderships in both parties are demanding that we be quiet. But I think we can all focus our attention on a sensible bipartisan plan, work together and pass it into law before our national credit rating is downgraded and we damage our chances of winning the global economic race. The chair knows, my colleagues know I'm not a particularly dramatic person, but I have to tell you I really believe that nothing less than the fate of the U.S. economy hangs in the balance. And I'm certainly willing to stay here day and night, weekends and holidays, into Washington, D.C. to help put a plan in motion. Madam President, uh, thank you for your attention. I yield the floor. The Senator from Delaware. Madam President, I rise uh, to follow the comments of my colleague uh, from Colorado, and I appreciate the forbearance of uh, my colleagues from Florida and from New Hampshire. Uh, I simply want to follow on the comments uh, of the Senator from Colorado in emphasizing the sense of urgency, the sense of frustration and of deep concern that I know many of us feel here in the Senate of the United States. On the 4th of July, as I went up and down the state of Delaware to different parades and picnics and gatherings, I had the opportunity to meet with and talk to thousands of Delawareans. And over and over, I would go up to men who were wearing hats that showed that they'd served, whether in the Korean War, the Vietnam War, the Second World War, and thank them for their service. And repeatedly, I'd hear the same thing back. We've done our job. We hope you'll do yours. When I was elected in 2010 to serve here in the United States Senate, I heard the same message from the folks across Delaware that I just heard Senator Udall reflect from the people of Colorado. Help the private sector create good jobs, deal with the deficit and debt, and do it in a bipartisan and responsible way. And I am gravely concerned that we are on the verge of the most predictable financial crisis in modern American history as we slowly grind towards the predicted deficit, excuse me, the, the predicted default on America's mortgage on August 2nd. Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner has warned us since the beginning of this year with the letter he sent to us on January 6th with repeated testimony in front of various committees of the Senate. We have gone well past the May 16th deadline and the Department of the Treasury is now using extraordinary measures to prevent us from defaulting on America's commitments. I have heard other analogies used but they are mistaken. This is not about cutting up the credit cards or ending the blank check for our current president. This is about whether we will continue to meet the commitments America has already made, whether we will continue to make the payments that we're already committed to for our troops in the field, for contractors who are providing military supplies and equipment, for our federal workforce, and for all the different programs and benefits the Senator spoke before me mentioned, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and others. We cannot afford the consequences of default. One study says we would lose 640,000 jobs, more than a half a million additional Americans needlessly thrown out of work just because of a foolish game of chicken. The cost to home mortgages, to car loans, to increases in the daily cost of living from food and gas would go up needlessly if we simply fail to uphold the tradition of meeting our commitments as a nation. And I'm here to say today that we cannot afford to have America become a bad investment. The best thing that we can do going forward is to restore certainty to our markets, to put some confidence back in the American economy, to make certain that the international community continues to regard us as the safest and best investment in the world. And the way to do that is to come together in a bipartisan way around a big deal, around $4 trillion in savings at least. The Senator from Colorado went in some detail into the Bipartisan Debt and Deficit Commission, chaired by Erskine Bowles and Alan Simpson, the Democrat former Chief of Staff and the Republican former Senator from Wyoming, and the 11 members of that commission, members of this body currently serving Senators, Republican and Democrat, who came together around a plan that would make $4 trillion in savings over the next decade. I think we should do no less than that. And I think the plan that we should be working on in detail now should include all four major areas where we have to have savings. Reductions in discretionary domestic spending reform to our entitlement programs, reductions in Pentagon spending, and increases in federal revenue through tax reform. All four of these have to be on the table. In my view, our values ask no less than that. 
As we work through a recovery, we need to continue to invest in education, in infrastructure, in innovation. But we also need to responsibly put together a bipartisan path that will take on the sacred cows of this institution and of America's tax code. Just three weeks ago, we had more than 70 senators cast votes to end the $6 billion in needless annual ethanol subsidies. I hope that was an opening door towards a recognition that on both sides of the aisle and in both chambers of this Congress, we need to be willing to make the tough votes, even though they will upset treasured constituencies, even though they will end up causing us potential political harm to reduce reckless federal spending, whether through the tax code or through unsustainable federal programs. In the end, Mr. President, I simply wanted to come to the floor today and add my voice to many of my colleagues on both sides of the aisle who are expressing our grave concern as the, talk, as the clock ticks away and as the hours left to August 2nd shrink, we need to come together. What Americans have done for generations is sacrificed. What legislators need to do now is compromise. There are in front of us reasonable, solid, bipartisan proposals that have been available to us since March and that this body and our leadership need to be willing to make responsible compromises to make happen. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor. Uh, Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent that I be... Senator from New Hampshire. Thank you, Mr. President. I, I ask unanimous consent that I be permitted to enter into a colloquy with my Republican colleague, Marco Rubio, for up to 20 minutes. Is there objection? Without objection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, it is an honor to be here with my esteemed colleague from Florida, Senator Marco Rubio. My husband Joe and I are blessed to be the parents of two wonderful children, our daughter Kate, who is six years old, and our son Jacob, who is three years old. This 4th of July, we walked together as a family in the parade in Wolfboro, New Hampshire. As I watched my children in the parade hand out candy to other New Hampshire children while they were standing with their parents, it reminded me again of why I am here and how concerned I am about the future of our country for Kate and Jacob and for all of our children. As parents, we all want to provide our children with a brighter future and at least the same, if not greater, opportunities than we have all had in the greatest country on earth. That is the American dream. That a young woman like me from a middle class family can have the opportunity to serve in this chamber. That someone like Senator Rubio, the son of Cuban immigrants, could serve as a senator from Florida, a leader of our great country who has come here to address our challenges. I am fearful that we are the first generation who will not pass on the American dream to the next generation. With the accumulation of $14 trillion in debt, we're borrowing 40 cents on the dollar just to fund our government. Half of our debt we have borrowed from other countries, including the country of China, a country that, that does not share our values. I'm concerned with the amount of debt that we have accumulated, that if we do not address this debt crisis right here and now, that we are ensuring that our children will have less opportunities than we have all had. We have seen what is happening in Greece. If we do not address our debt with real, substantive, legislative proposals, things that we have already proposed in this chamber, members of both sides of the aisle, the balanced budget amendment, a spending cap legislation, how about a real budget resolution that reduces spending and puts forth a responsible fiscal plan for this country? We will be setting up our children to pay for our failure to act today with either massive tax increases or the value of our dollar will be diminished and everything that they own will be worth less than everything that we own and it will diminish their economic opportunities in this great country. Senator Rubio, I know that you're also the father of four young children. What is it that you are most concerned about with respect to the future of our great country? First, I want to, uh, to thank the senator from New Hampshire for allowing us the opportunity to do this together. I think this is important. She brings a tremendous amount of credibility to this discussion. Uh, 
she's not just a mother and, and, a, and a senator, but she's also a small business owner who's run a small business or been there on the front lines with her husband running a small business who recently got off the campaign trail, as I did, and heard from job creators all across the state as to what they're talking about. And we're, we're going to get that to that in a moment. But as you've rightfully outlined, I am the father of four young children, of four children that I think deserve to inherit a country as great as the one that my parents and their generation left us. And that's really what we're debating here at the end of the day. If you look at the numbers, they're absolutely startling. And I think these numbers have been said before, but you can't say them enough. $14.3 trillion of debt. Trillion is not a number or a figure I've ever used in my life until I got to Washington. I don't know where else in the world that applies, other than in the United States Congress, the term trillion. $14.3 trillion is our debt. Our kids already owe $46,000, and my oldest is only 11. Already owes $46,000. Our total debt is about to reach the size of our entire economy. So that's kind of the framework in which we're operating in when we discuss this. Now, I actually think we're closer to some sort of an agreement on this, Senator Ayotte, than a lot of people realize. This, I've heard the term thrown around in the last couple of days, a balanced approach to dealing with it. And I think there's agreement that there has to be a balanced approach. I certainly have always said that you cannot simply cut your way out of this problem. You have to have a combination of cuts and growth, growth in revenues to government. I think the debate is, the debate is, how do you accomplish these two things? And I'm not going to focus so much on the cut part of it today. I want to focus on the revenue part of it, because that's the part the Rep. President and some of my colleagues here have focused on over the last day, this idea of getting more revenue, or this new term, revenue enhancers, which is Washington talk for more money to the government. And according to the President, some in his party, most in his party, I should say, the idea is simple. They think that there's a bunch of people out there in America that are making a lot of money, more money than maybe they should be making, and they just need to pay more in taxes. And if these people pay more in taxes, then all these problems will be get a lot easier to deal with. That's kind of the, 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 the viewpoint they bring to this debate. Yesterday we saw, and I know tomorrow the majority leader uh, will be voting here on the floor on something the majority leader has offered up, something called the sense of the Senate which people watching at home may wonder, what is that? Well, that basically means what's, what's on the Senate's mind. And the sense of the Senate under this thing that we're going to be voting on tomorrow is basically that you've got a bunch of people in this country that make over a million dollars and that these people need to do more to help with the debt. That's basically the sense of the Senate that there's going to be a vote on tomorrow. It's very interesting things. So I looked at it because ultimately this is a serious issue. So let's explore this with an open mind. Let's not be doctrinaire, right? Let's not be blindly ideological. Let's look at this from a common sense perspective. This idea that all these millionaires and billionaires, if they just paid more taxes, this, these problems would be solved. Let's analyze it, because this is all about math. And here's the fact. The fact is it doesn't solve the problem. First of all, if you taxed these people at 100%, if basically next year you said, look, every penny you make next year, the government's going to take it from you, it still doesn't solve the debt. Not only does that not solve the debt problem, but I looked at a host of other, some great publication that came out today from the Joint Economics Committee. Our colleague, Senator DeMint, is, is, chairs it. And it kind of outlines some of the tax increases being proposed by our colleagues in the Democratic Party and the President to solve the debt problem. And you add them all up. You add all of these things up, the jet airplanes, the oil companies, all the other things they talk about. You put them all together in one big batch, and you know what it does? It basically deals with nine days and 23 hours worth of deficit spending. Nine days and 20, it doesn't even get to 10 days of deficit spending. That's how much it solves. So all this talk about going after people that make all this money, it buys you nine days and 23 hours. Let's round it off. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. It buys them 10 days of deficit spending reduction. That's what all this stuff rounds up to. So here's the bottom line. These tax increases they're talking about these so-called revenue enhancers, they don't, they don't solve the problem. So what do we do then? Because clearly we have to do two things. One, we have to hold the line on spending. I mean, if you keep digging yourself in the hole, the hole is going to bury you. But the other thing is, how do you start generating revenue for government so it can start paying down this debt? And that's what the debate should be about. We already know these taxes they're talking about don't work. So here's what works. Here's what I would suggest works in a balanced approach, using the president's terminology. Let's stop talking about new taxes and start talking about creating new taxpayers, which basically means jobs. Now, here in Washington, this debt is the number one issue on everyone's mind, and rightfully so, it is a major issue. But everywhere else in the real world, the number one issue on people's minds are jobs. And I'll tell you, every other problem facing America, a mortgage crisis, home foreclosure crisis, this debt problem, 
All of these issues get easier to deal with if people are gainfully employed across America. And the impact that unemployment's having across this country is devastating. We hear about unemployment in facts and figures. They give us numbers, Senator Ayotte. Oh, X percent people are unemployed. Well, here's the, there's stories behind every one of those people. You know who a lot of these people are that are unemployed in America? There are people that have done everything they've been asked to do and they've done it right. Maybe they served their country overseas. Maybe they went to college and got a degree and now came back home. Maybe they worked for 10 or 20 years and did a really good job at work and now you know what? They can't find a job. Or maybe they were lucky enough to find a job after losing their original job, but it pays them half as much and they work twice as long. That is the real face of unemployment in America, of people that are hurting. And our job here is to do everything we can to make it easier for them to find a job, not harder. And I think that's what we have to do when it comes to a balanced approach and when we talk about revenue. We don't need new taxes. We need new taxpayers, people that are gainfully employed, making money and paying into the tax system. And then we need a government that has the discipline to take that additional revenue and use it to pay down the debt and never grow it again. And that's what we should be focused on, and that's not what we're not focused on. So you look at all these taxes that are being proposed, and here's what I say. I say we should analyze every single one of them through the lens of job creation, issue number one in America. I want to know which one of these taxes that they're proposing will create jobs. I want to know how many jobs are going to be created by the plane tax? How many jobs are going to be created by the oil company tax that I heard so much about? How many, how many jobs are created by going after the millionaires and billionaires that the president talks about? I want to know how many jobs do they create? Because I'll tell you, and I'm going to turn it over to Senator A on a second, I'm interested for her perspective on this as a job creator, as the spouse of a job creator who runs a small business, as someone like me who just came off the campaign trail. Let me tell you something. I traveled the state of Florida for two years campaigning. I have never met a job creator who told me that they were waiting for the next tax increase before they started growing their business. I've never met a single job creator who's ever said to me, I can't wait till government raises taxes again so I can go out and create a job. And I'm curious to know if they say that in New Hampshire because they don't say that in Florida. And so my view on all this is I want to know how many jobs these tax increases the president proposes will create because if they're not creating jobs and they're not creating new taxpayers, they're not solving the problem. Senator Ayo, I don't know what your perspective is on that. Uh, Senator Rubio, 